today we are going to be playing through Ex Novo, which is this guy, there's the cover. Uh, this is a, well, to read the description that's there, it's a city building game to generate playable settlements for use in other creative endeavors. Which again, uh, marks it out, along with some of the stuff I've done recently, as something a little different for me. Uh, and this is something I think is going to be a really fascinating exploration. Uh, I got this on itch.io, uh, and you guys can find it there if you look at Shark Bomb Studios. Uh, and they actually have a link, and I think it's just sharkbombstudios.itch.io. Um, I'm, I'm running a little bit behind time, um, and so I didn't get to confirm that for myself before I started this. Let me just check. Um, Shark Bombs, there we go, Shark Bombs. Dot itch dot io will take you to their page. Uh, and this is a playable city generator, which to me is an absolutely fascinating concept, and I love this idea very, very much. Uh, so I'm looking forward to having a crack at it and seeing how it plays. Uh, actually, I see right now, for anyone who's interested, as I look at the Shark Bomb Studios page, it is on sale. It is currently down to $8 from 10 So if you are... Uh, interested in checking it out. Now might be a good time to grab it. But we're going to dive in and have a crack at this and see how it goes. So the big deal with Ex Novo, as, as it says, is we're going to be building a city and we're going to be building it from the ground level up. Now this is a print and play uh, and I have, um, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure that this is, I've got a lot of stutter here. Okay, well we're good. Uh, this is a print and play and um, let me just lose the box cover. Uh, it prints out um, a bunch of stuff and there's a chunk, chunk of rules and then these tables. And the tables are going to be our random generators for this game. Um, and we use those predominantly during what's called the development phase where we're developing the city. Uh, that's the longest phase of this game. Uh, and there are a few steps before we get there and one afterwards just to kind of top and tail everything and leave it looking all nice. Um, so, uh, oh, Billy. Oh, hello, Billy. Uh, I wish so badly I could watch, but I'm prepping for Gen Con Online. Break a leg. Thank you so much, Billy. I really appreciate that. Um, yes, I'm diving into Gen Con Online straight after this playthrough as well. Um, I have, uh, uh, I'm actually uh, demoing Wizard Kittens from Magpie Games uh, at Gen Con Online. Um, so, as is, as is Billy, in fact. Uh, we're both doing that. He's just starting a little earlier than I am. Uh, Billy, good luck. I hope that goes really well. And uh, I'm looking forward to diving into it myself as well. Um, so that's something that's coming up for me. So I do have a hard cutoff on this. So I, that's kind of predetermined the first part of this game. So in terms of how we're going to build the city, uh, it's going to be fully drawn out. Uh, I have my sheet here to draw this on. I'm using a piece of legal paper, really just so that I can kind of expand a little bit beyond... Uh, standard letter. Um, but uh, I'm just going to turn off my iPad now that I know I'm running. Um, this is all going to be drawn out based on some random rolls on the table. And the first thing that you're going to do is kind of have a discussion. Now, obviously, when you're playing this solo, this is one to four players. When you're playing solo, you don't really need to have that discussion because you're kind of doing what you want to do. But the idea of it is it gives you an opportunity to set expectations for what is going to be done throughout this game. Um, it means that if the first couple of pieces of development that are had are around the idea of, uh, you know, building up this beautiful forested elven woodland, uh, the next player doesn't come along and suddenly roll up, um, you know, a, a den of uh, deckers uh, who are going to hack into some kind of cybernet. Uh, and you don't have that kind of clash of worlds. That's the purpose of that discussion. Let's just work out what we're going to do, but also set the scale of the city that we're going to create. Uh, and that's the thing I'm going to do very quickly now. Mm. And I have pre-planned what I want to do with this because I have my hard cutoff today. Uh, so I want to make sure that um, uh, I have, you know, I can get enough done to give you guys a feel for the game, but also not run over time. So this is actually going to be... Uh, the first two tables here, what we would normally do is roll a d6 on them. Uh, and I'll just show you briefly a little closer what these are. So these are size and age of our town. 
Uh, oh, and I've just realized the one thing I need to do is grab tokens because I wasn't thinking about that. And uh, I'm going to grab these guys. Those of you who watched me play The Pursuit of Happiness recently will recognize these little black cubes. Uh, they are going to be the citizen tokens that identify... Um, I think that's going to be enough. Uh, these come into play a little later, uh, but they are determined as, to a certain extent by what we are doing. So we are going to try and do a medium city. So I'm going to split the map with 11 lines and set aside 13 citizen tokens. So let's just go 3, 6, 9, 12, 13. So those are my citizen tokens and they, oops, they're off screen. They will come into play throughout the game and we'll sort of see them uh, come along as they do. Uh, you could easily roll a d6 to decide what you want to do. I'm just predetermining this for myself. Uh, we also have the ages of the city, uh, and that determines how many development phases you will play through. I'm going to do a grown city. I'm just going to make notes of what I'm doing just so that this... So this is going to be a medium grown city. And what the grown city means is we are going to have 10 development phases. So once we have the basis, the foundation of our city, we're going to play 10 uh, events, essentially, to generate our city further. Um, so that is that taken care of. Uh, we are done. We don't need to worry about that. Um, just to give you a quick overview of the randomization in this, as we're going to move into that coming forward... Um, there are three different types of randomization in this game. There is D6 randomization where you simply roll a D6. This is a three. Uh, D6, for anybody who happens to be watching who is not aware, a D6 is a six-sided die. Uh, one to six uh, as a general rule. Sometimes there's something wonky about them. You know, the game maybe goes three to eight or something like that. Um, but as a general rule, a D6 and what you would call a D6 is a standard six-sided die. And if you didn't happen to know this, the opposing sides of a D6 add up to seven. So if I flip this two, it will be the five. The six flips to the one and the four flips to the three. Uh, they are always opposing uh, opposite sides, and uh, the average roll on a d6 is, uh, I presume, going to be three, I guess? I haven't actually looked at a single d6 to see. It should, I mean, ideally, it's evenly split down the middle. Um, now, when you also have a 2d6 roll, which means you roll two dice. When you roll two dice, you are going to get a result between 2 and 12. Uh, in this case, we've rolled a 10. And the average for 2d6 is going to be 7. Uh, that is the standard. There are the most combinations of uh, a result on 2d6 are 7. doesn't really matter too much in this game, but if we end up with middling results uh, rather than the extremes of tables, that's mostly going to be why. This game also deals with a d666, uh, and what that means is we're going to take all three of these dice, and I'm going to pick the order red, yellow, blue. Though That's going to be my order, and I'm going to roll these up, and so this result here is actually a roll of 336. So red three, yellow three, blue six. Uh, and that's going to enable us to go onto a table that has, uh, I guess it would be 216 combinations. Um, because it can be any of those sixes. Uh, you know, you can one, 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 two, one, one, three, and so on. Um, so those are going to be the types of roles that we're going to be making in this game. Now, uh, I've decided, first of all, that I'm going to be doing this medium city. So I have to split the map with 11 lines. And what that means is I'm simply going to take my sheet of paper and I'm going to draw 11 lines that come on one edge of the map and go off the other edge of the map. I'm going to freehand draw all of this. I could probably do it um, on a graphic program, but I don't really have any skill with those. So this is entirely going to be freehand drawn. Black for... Uh, kind of administrative stuff, and as long as I remember to switch to it, I'm going to use a blue pen for features and things like that. But, so we're just going to draw 11 lines, so we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, Let's go seven. Um, let's do eight. 
And then for the last three, let's go for things that are a little bit more. Let's go uh, nine, 10, and let's go 11. So we've got some kind of weird wonky shapes here. These are going to all pan out to be something, districts of the city, uh, regions of, of different types of terrain, things like that. Um, but the key thing is we want to split that map up so that we have lots of different, uh, different shapes and things like that. Um, this will give us a bit of a basis for what we're going to move on to. Um, so that kind of gives you the outline of your, your very, very basic city. Um, we've also talked about having 10 development phases. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do 10 little checkboxes here. Um, and that way I can just check a box. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. I can check a box as I go through and know that I have completed that phase. Uh, so that is... If I just go back to, to where we are starting, that is our discussion phase completed. We've set the oh, well, we haven't set the assumptions actually, so let's do that. Um, the assumptions for this, so I've seen a couple of there's a couple of plays of this on YouTube, and they've both done sort of fantasy worlds. So I was toying with the idea of doing something wholly more realistic. Uh, or going for something a little bit futuristic. Now, I have no knowledge of city planning. I don't have a particular skill with topography, geography, botany, anything like that. So whenever I do this kind of a game, I'm making everything up off the top of my head. I think I'm going to go for something a little bit more in the science fiction realm. And we'll see exactly what that is. But we're going to assume a certain degree of technological advancement. Hmm. I'm not going to set the type of realm just yet because I want to sort of see where, um, you know, where the game takes us before I do anything like that. Um, game expectations is just kind of what are we doing with this? What is the purpose of this playthrough? Are we creating a world for an RPG? Are we creating a map for a board game? You know, what what's the logic of what we're doing right here? Um, I forget the name of the user who put it very succinctly when I, I glanced at a playthrough on YouTube, and they just said, I'm, I'm playing this to show off Ex Novo, and that's exactly what I'm doing. Uh, that is the purpose of this game. Target size we have discussed, uh, target age we have discussed. So we move on to the founding phase. The founding phase is going to give us the basic topography of the land that we have settled on. It's going to give us some features and a few bits and pieces like that, and it's going to tell us something about the people who settled here. So we're going to move straight on to that. Um, and for that, we're going to come back to our tables. We've dealt with the scale and the size, so we're going to move on and... Forgive me while I fumble through this a little bit. Um, here we go. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to roll once. I think it's once. Let me just confirm that. Major geography. Roll on. Yes, we're going to draw once on the terrain geography table. This is a 2d6 roll, so we have results from 2 to 10. Uh, I'm not going to go through what everything is. I'm just going to roll us up. We get an 8. So 8 says Riverland. Gentle and calm, or treacherous and angry? What is the reason for this river's temperament, and how do the citizens deal with that? Okay, so draw a wide, meandering river crossing the map. So I'm going to get my blue pen out here. Um, so this is a wide river. This this is the major geography of our region. So, you know, this, this was presumably in some way, shape, or form... Um, uh, part of the reason that we chose this area to settle. Um, so we're going to have a wide river that's going to go, let's have it going like so. It's just going to carve a path through the majority of our map like so. And I'm just going to very, very Quickly. I'm not going to do a lot of shading and things like that in this because I don't want to get this too complicated and I don't want to take too long but I'm just going to shade in the river like so nothing complicated that is our river so this river runs through 
the center of our map, crosses our map, and is quite wide. It said meandering. I haven't done it crazily meandering, but I think that to a certain extent, you know, we've got a futuristic realm here. I think there's a, there's a degree to which we may have learned to control that. However, I am going to say that this is a river. This is a dangerous... Uh, the river is going to be... Um, uh, it's more pollutant than liquid. Or than, than water. Um, it's toxic and lethal. So this is a dangerous, dangerous river. This is not somewhere that you want to cross voluntarily. Uh, not some, Certainly not something you want to go into. That would be a terribly bad idea. Um, so this is our primary geography. Uh, how do the citizens deal with that? Uh, they have, to a certain extent, controlled the river. Um, it is guided, at least, so that it passes through uh, without kind of splitting. It doesn't split off anymore. There were, pro there were tributaries to this river at some point in time that have been blocked off, uh, so that this is uh, at least traveling somewhat safely through the city. Um, they, the crossing is only via bridges. You do not go, and the bridges are up. You know, they're they're substantially above the the water level of the river. In no way, shape, or form do you want to get to a point where you're breathing this stuff in easily. So that is our major geography. The next step of the founding phase, if I can just get that, I'm going to try and dog ear that page. Um, the next step of the founding phase is going to be. Uh, terrain features, yes. So we do four terrain features. Uh, again, this is the other half of this page. It's another 2d6. Uh, and we're going to roll four times on this table to work out the specific features of this area. So we get, uh, what is that? That is a four. Four is mountains. A lone mountain or a small mountain range. What riches do these mountain holds? And what destroys the careless? Um... One thing to throw out at this point, uh, just to kind of demonstrate, they show you a little bit of suggestion for what terrain could look like. Um, you know, this isn't something that's designed to be uh, crazily detailed. You're not drawing uh, an aerial photograph here. You're doing map representations. So they say things like rivers or singular hills can be drawn directly, but for something like a massive forest, draw like a dashed outline uh, and fill it with trees so that you know roughly what you're dealing with. Um, you may also have to remove terrain, um, and in which case you change what you've drawn in some way. So if the river dries up, maybe we shade it a different color. Or uh, I realize telling the difference between the blue and the black is almost impossible for you guys, but I don't actually have any other color pens with me right now, so my apologies for that. Um, but yes, you, you simply change how something looks. So maybe I change the shading a little bit. But that's that's what you do uh, in order to, you know, as you adapt with this. So we have a mountain. Um, now, obviously, if we're going for something that's a little bit more futuristic, uh, I think what we're probably going to do is we're going to... let's let, Where are we going to put our mountain? Th the river's obviously curved a little bit, so I feel like the mountain's probably more over here. Um... Let's put it up in this, towards this corner. Uh, so for the mountain, I'm going to do traditional kind of this shape. And it's a big one. That is a major, major mountain. Uh, and now the deal with this mountain is it is fundamentally built on, uh, it's, it's a mountain that has formed out of you know, decades, if not centuries, of human abuse. Uh, and it was, at one point, a scrap pile that has essentially developed into uh, a, a steel source, uh, a metal source. Uh, so the mountain uh, is going to be uh, a scrap pile. Uh, that becomes helpful because, you know, you can go to said scrap pile and 
extract something useful from it. It's huge. It's massive. It's the you know the world's biggest landfill, um, and it is something that has become necessary because we, you know we're running out of resources. It's not something that is somewhere people go by um, by choice, uh, and the reason for that is it is jagged and unpredictable. Um, so what, what was the question? It was uh, specifically what destroys the careless? Uh, and what destroys the careless is that the, what the, 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 the levels, if you like, that make up that mountain are not safe. Uh, you know, you take, you put one foot wrong and you are going to drop like a stone. Uh, because it will shift the entire makeup of the mountain. And only people who are specially trained can actually go up and extract stuff from the mountain, because if you take the wrong thing out, you could essentially cause a metallic landslide. Not something you really want happening on a regular basis. So that's feature number one. Feature number two is going to be eight. Eight is a lake. A larger lake or a series of smaller ones. Uh, what forms this lake and what creatures frequent it? So, I think we're going to do the lake. The lake's going to be on the opposite side. The, mountain, the mountain's its own problem. The lake is going to be... Let's do... Let's do something like this. So this is our lake here. And our, this lake is um, something of a natural phenomenon. It is cleaner water. Cleaner being the key phrase. It is not clean by any stretch. Um, this is not water you would drink straight out of the lake. But it requires substantially less in the way of refining. And it is... Uh, it, comes, it has a purer flavour because it's been processed less by the time that it's done. So it is something of an extraordinary... Um, extraordinary thing. Uh... What creatures frequent it? Uh, it has a form of mollusk. Um, and they exist at the bottom of the lake. Um, and their exact purpose and their exact... Um, you know, uh, what's the word I want? The... Their... Etymology, um, that's the wrong phrase. Their um, ancestry is essentially unknown. We don't really know how they found their way there. Uh, they somehow survive in the pollutants, and it would appear, kind of like trees convert carbon dioxide into oxygen, it would appear that somehow these mollusks are able to purify a small amount of this water. Beyond that, you know, who's to say? There's very, very little logic in uh, how they do what they do. But that's what they are. Um, ooh, throwing things around. Uh, what forms this lake? We don't know. Uh, it was there. It's, it's, it exists. It doesn't... It has underground feeding. It's almost like groundwater, I think. Uh, but it... Exactly how it has formed such a big lake is still something of a mystery. Four again. More mountains. Uh, a lone mountain or a small mountain range. Uh, okay, we've obviously got the the, the scrap heap. Um, we're going to have more of a mountain range. Um, and that mountain range is going to be over here. So we're going to go... Um, we're going to draw...
just a little series of peaks and it's an area that is uh, oh what's the right what riches do these mountains hold and what destroys the careless um the deal with these mountains is that they um what are they going to hold they're going to hold uh let's just add some notes here so mountain range the mountain range holds um didn't actually write down that that was a steel source. Uh, the mountain range here holds um, a form of um, it's a uh, a form of and I, I'm my science here is going to be way off, so please don't at me for. Uh, my scientific knowledge, but it's going to be a form of polarized uh, metal, um, such that it has kind of like a, it, it can be used for an anti gravity system, uh, and it's something that is used for a variety of purposes, and it's uh, it's existed forever as far as we can tell, but it wasn't the it's any potential use was not understood until certain technologies were developed, so. Um, it's a polarized metal. The danger with that is, uh, what uh, in terms of what destroys the careless, um, is it can ha it can react uh, with other metallic uh, compounds, uh, and so it's very very critical that um, anybody who is going in there is extremely careful what they take. Um, because, you know, it's not necessarily going to play ball uh, with this stuff. And then our final terrain feature is going to be a trench. Um, a canyon, fjord, chasm, or rugged cliffs. What animals live in these walls and what can be found at the bottom? I have an answer for this one already. And the answer for this is going to be uh, the trench is going to be here. And it's going to be a... It's not going to be super deep, super wide, but it is going to be, uh, oh, sorry, not super deep. It's not going to be uh, super long or super wide, but what this is, is one of the, um, this is going to be like an old, it sort of formed an oxbow. Uh, this was where the river used to travel, and um, it has been engineered to be closed off and so there there is our our trench uh, it is actually surprisingly deep and it wasn't until uh, efforts were made to seal off the river that the depth of this thing was fully understood um, so the questions I'm being asked here are what animals live in these walls and what can be found at the bottom excuse me what can be found at the bottom um, the trench itself is home to um, let's say they it's it's like uh hmm they are They're called firefish. They're not actually fish, um, but they, they were referred to as such because they came out of the trench uh, that the river had used to go through. Um, and they're kind of like a firefly, but huge. Um, you know, this thing, the, the, the average size, and it's not uncommon to see something on the extreme large end, but the, what, what would be sort of the typical size is, is the size of a pigeon. Um, and they can get as big as, you know, an overgrown turkey. Uh, but these things are, they're flighted animals, uh, that have, that glow. Um, and they were only discovered when the river was taken out of the oxbow. Um, 
and they glow the way that a firefly would, but they're extremely bright because they're these huge creatures. Uh, so the looking down into the trench uh, is kind of like looking into, um, you know, slow motion sparks from, uh, uh, from cutting metal or something like that. There's just kind of movement of these lights. Uh, very hypnotic. What can be found at the bottom? Um, what can be found at the bottom is uh, an excretion from these creatures. Uh, it's kind of like uh, guano, essentially. So it's firefish guano, um, which is an unstable uh, light source. Uh, it's like a light fuel, essentially. Um, I'm going to call it light fuel, even though I'm, I'm aware that's a weird thing to say. But it's essentially something that can be used. It can be put into um, lanterns and things like that. Or, you know, like a, I say lantern. Uh, obviously, we're far more technologically advanced than that. But it can be used as uh, some form of light source. It can be encased, but it must be completely encased. Uh, because if it... Um, uh, it's, it's highly volatile, it's spontaneously combustible, um, and it's very, very possible for, uh, you know, an incomplete casing to explode uh, if, for some reason, it is not properly cared for. So it's, it's a highly... Uh, uh, I'm going to actually put down there, it's spontaneously combustible. Um, it would appear that the bottom of the trench is at least uh, humid enough and damp enough and probably cold enough that it does not uh, actually combust down there. It doesn't cause a problem in that sense, but it is something that needs to be taken care of. So there we have it. There are our four terrain features. Uh, we're going to move on to the purpose of why we are here. And again, just reading from the rules as we go. Um, the purpose, uh, it's... Uh, we have, to, we have the surroundings. Let's find out what was special enough to, find a, to found a settlement here. Was it food? Was it a trade route? Uh, and things like that. So we roll on the purpose location. We're then going to decide, and I'm just going to run through these because it's one roll each. We're going to decide who initiated the founding. Um, and we're going to draw our first settlement as a result. Uh, we are going to work out the hierarchy that exists. Um, and work out how the settlers of this city arrived. Um, we're going to work out what the factions are in the city, and then we're going to name it. So that's our next sequence. So first up, we have the, the location purpose. This is another 2d6 table. And again, I'm not going to read everything out. Uh, we're going to roll a 7. So the purpose is abundant edible plants. Good soil, great weather, or the boon of the gods. Why is food so abundant here? And who or what did the settlers have to push back to claim this place? Add a resource. Sure. Okay. Um, absolutely. So these are going to be... This is this is futuristic. I think this is, this is slowly becoming kind of almost post... Not post-apocalyptic precisely, but... Um, we're certainly in the range of diesel punk uh, and heading south uh, into, you know, a really kind of not maybe not dystopian might be the wrong word, but certainly a very um, fractured and damaged society, at least see, kind of seems where we're going. Um, and um, I'm just going to draw on here uh, against the edge of the uh, trench here. Um, and... You don't have to sort of draw this much, um, but I'm just kind of indicating the spread. Uh, these are, I'm just gonna draw a box around this, uh, just as, so here is our foundational topography. Uh, why was it found here? Abundant food? Well, the food was actually, and you know, this is a society that lives on what it can. Um, they're tubers. Uh, and they're an extremely nutritional tuber. Uh, they grew in small numbers. Uh, it was kind of one of those things, I think, um, uh, it was necessity. Um, 
that this was a, a, a staying point. We don't quite, we haven't worked out how we arrived there yet, but it was a necessity that of staying there because of these tubers. And um, through trial and error discovered that by moving the river, the area the river left behind became actually abundant in these tubers. Uh, not just enough for the small settlement, but enough to you know, develop something beyond that. So they are highly nutritional. Um, and, or nutritious, I guess is the word I should say there. Uh, and they exist um, where the river was pushed back. Um, so they kind of exist on, assuming, uh, in fact, I'm just going to draw this right now. Uh, this is uh, just a compass. It doesn't serve any other purpose. But the south side of this trench, and the southwestern side specifically, further away from the mountain, is where these tubers grow. And they grew there because the river was pushed back. Um, uh, why is it so abundant? Um, who or what did the settlers have to push back to claim? Well, we've talked about that. Why Why is it so abundant? It's a very, very hardy tuber. Um, the problem is that the majority of the places that you find it, it's actually so kind of brittle and harsh. It, you almost can't eat it. Uh, it requires hydration, and even then, it can be so brittle that it actually cuts the inside of the mouth. The deal with this here is because the land underneath this space is very... Um, you know, it's got the residue of the river... Uh, bed. Uh, essentially, it's it's groundwater exists. It's the groundwater also coming off this lake, uh, and that's part of the abundance as well. Is that the lake feeds into the tuber growth? Uh, they are actually growing. Still not. It's it's not pleasant. It's not like you're eating you know celery where it's a lot of water. Uh, it's still more uh, drier than that. But it is at least edible, and it's something uh, highly nutritious, and it's something that here specifically. Uh, it can be eaten relatively easily. The decision. So why? Uh, not what was the purpose of the location, but what was the purpose of us coming here? Uh, that is going to be a two and a five. That's another seven. Pioneers looking for an opportunity. Well, I think that makes a great deal of sense. Um, an uncertain future and the promise of riches or cheap new land. What made the condition of their home so bad that they set out? Uh, I think that, um, uh, I'm just going to write here, so we have pioneers. What made the condition of their land so bad that they set out? Well, I think they too lived close to a river, and that possibly explains why the, the, uh, the river is somewhere they gravitated towards. But that river was equally polluted, but there was nothing that they could do about it. And it was getting to the point where it was destroying all the land around it, and there was no way that they could stay put. So they, uh, an expeditionary group, or several expeditionary groups, set out, and these guys found this place. And when they realized, you know, for them, this water, as toxic as it is, and as dangerous as it is, as it is it's at least keeping itself within the bounds of its own banks. And it's not destroying what is outside of them at this point. And so that, you know, that was that was their, their reason for uh, uh, coming towards it uh, and walking along it until they found uh, the mountain and the mountain range where they have these resources that are extremely valuable for them. Actually, that's a point. Uh, let's just draw. Uh, this is a, a it looks like a gold bar, doesn't it? Um, I'm going to turn this into a little bit more of a girder. Um, this is just an indication that uh, that is the resource um, that is of use here. Are these steel? Um, uh, and then in here, uh, we're going to do, I'm just going to do this symbol, and I'm going to do the magnetic polarization. So there's polarized metal in those mountains. Um, they found these two resources, and they said, well, you know what? We're going to stay there. There's enough food here to keep us here while we explore the area. And in the process, they realized they could redirect the river. And everything kind of went from there. So that's our purpose. Uh, and what we're going to do, there's two parts to this. Um, 
when we do our settlement decision, we roll on it, we draw the first settlement district, and we move a citizen token from the pool to the city. Um, so, here's a thing on districts. Um, where is the districts? Just so that we understand what we're dealing with. Uh, districts are going to be very, very, very key to... So, citizen tokens, first of all... Um, they are the people living in the city. So each one of these black cubes is going to represent people living in the city. Uh, the growth pool that we have is 13 citizen tokens. So that's what we have to do with. Um, they will be moved into the city. They can also be moved into the different factions that are created. So there's, there's sort of both of those things can happen. Uh, when they're moved to the city, you put them on the map close to it. So I'll actually take someone off and place them down wherever is relevant. Um, and they are the people living in the city that are um, politically neutral. They don't sort of uh, adhere to a particular faction. Uh, if they're moved on, if I'm going to create space up, and I'll move this over as I do. I'm going to create space up here in the right-hand corner for the factions, and when I do that, the, anyone who goes into a faction will be moved up there, and that indicates political power in that faction. Um, yes, and if a district ever gets removed, you take the system token back from it. Districts are, uh, this is, this is where people work, this is where they live, this is where, you know, everything that they do in their daily life plays out. Um, they can have a three-tiered density, so they can be fairly sparsely populated, or they can be extremely populated. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Uh, when you draw uh, a district, you draw a blob or a shape uh, or, you know, a, um, a polygon that represents the uh, the district. And you kind of... Um, so where, for example, and we've kind of covered this over with the river, but where here our region lines are quite tightly marked together, if that triangle was kind of in play as a potential district, it alone would not be one if this whole space here was also a district. You want your districts to be roughly the same size wherever they end up. Um, when it gains density, you can fill it in, repeat the outline, whatever you want to do to indicate that the density has increased. When you add it, you can choose. So this first time, we are create. there are no districts on this map right now because one hasn't come into play. So we are going to create a district. If the next prompt I get says add another district, I can add another district, uh, but unless it specifies otherwise, I can also choose to increase the density of the district that I already have. Um, so that is uh, completely done. Um, when you add a district, you bring a citizen across to it. You can, If you have to add a district, you can do that even when you run out of these things. Um, you can spill over. Like, there's a whole bunch of stuff here that, uh, uh, you know, we probably won't come up. If you were doing a metropolis-sized city, which is a lot bigger than this, you might run into things like spillover. I'm just making sure I've covered everything you guys need to know. Um, obviously, it's possible that you can remove a district. Um, uh, yes, that's that, that's that. Um... Yep, I think that's everything that needs to be known. Uh, yeah, so that's everything that you need to know about districts. So we have to add a district, um, and we are going to add that. Um, we're going to add that, and it's going to be kind of where the first area of this settlement came into being, because this is uh, obviously part of the purpose of why they, they came here. Um, oh, I didn't write in. So my pioneers left home because river over polluted and destroyed land. Not going to make the same mistake again, obviously. <clears throat> so, our first district is going to be... <clears throat> I think it's going to be between the tubers and the lake. 
and it's going to be a long strip like so. And you can increase density of districts by adding more lines into it. Uh, or you can hatch them, like you can do anything you want. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is a first level district is going to be empty and then I'll cross hatch uh, as it fills up. So I'm going to take a citizen and add them into the citizen pool here. Um, so that's that. Uh, that has been taken care of. Um, let's just go back. So uh, we have done that. We've added the first district and moved our citizen to the city. Hierarchy. What is our hierarchy? We're going to roll a d6 for this. Three. It is an improvisational hierarchy. That seems highly appropriate, given everything that's come through so far. Experts are, or rulers are put together when necessary. Who manages these, this process, and how are these people selected? Um, that's a fascinating question, actually. Uh, who does manage an improvisational hierarchy? And... You know, is there some kind of a basis to it? Uh, my assumption, I just want to check one thing. Uh, draw the route that led the settlers here. Yeah. Um, this is going to be... Um, I think who decides this is the people. I th But I think that it is entirely based... They have learned their lesson from the land that they destroyed the last time, and they're going for a slightly utopian ideal. Uh, and so they have actually formed um, a democratic meritocracy. My political science is no good. I don't know if that is a feasible combination. Uh, but it is essentially a, a meritocracy where, when necessity requires decision-making, the people pick who they believe is going to be the most skilled individual at the job. There's no campaigning. There is proof by work. Um, and uh, who manages this and how are they selected? So selected, um, I'm going to say by portfolio, by the citizen. Z um, that's a very utopian ideal. Uh, that's how they came into it. I feel like this is probably not going to function fully, but this is what they are trying to achieve. Uh, I just realized I missed a uh, comment here from the Braless Wonder, who says, played my very first RPG a few weeks ago, bad board gamer I know, and had no idea how much fun the rolling to build characters and set the world was. Uh, slightly confusing sentence, but you know what I mean. Enjoying the story you're building so far. Thank you very much. Um, I My first RPG, uh, I played two, actually, before I did Thousand Year Old Vampire a few weeks ago. Uh, and they were both one-shots, and um, one of them, I think we did some rolling to generate characters. I forget, because it was years ago that I played it. It was back in 2013 that I played it. Um, the other one was entirely user-generated, so there wasn't rolling for anything, it was all discussion-based. Uh, and so, yeah, it, I, the, the world of RPGs is so wide, and I, th I think with solo ones you kind of get lots of alternatives because you don't have a GM, you don't have people rolling against each other as much, you just kind of have whatever it plays through. But yeah, they're a fascinating thing to uh, to play through. I'm, I'm really, in this is why I've kind of moved my stream over to be I guess, you know, three-fifths board games, two-fifths RPGs, and I think I'm going to try and keep that ratio, because I just love what I'm discovering with all of these. The worlds that are coming out of my head just because, you know, I have a thing to create is extraordinary. Okay, so that's our power. We've decided that. Now we have to draw the route that our settlers took to get here. Um, I would imagine that they walked along. I think uh, their approach route was probably along the river, so they came along the river and came to where it bends. And from here, they could see the scrap pile on this side. And they could see... Oh, has my... Yes, my iPhone camera has frozen. Give me just a second. Um, I'm just going to refresh that. There we go. That should be back. Yep, we're back to rice. So they came along the river, and from here they could see 
the mountain range, they could see the scrap pile. The scrap pile caught their attention first of all, and exploration from here is what led them to the lake, and it was over there that they decided to... Um, to settle. So they came in from this side and followed the river around, essentially, uh, while exploring. So factions. Um, we roll to find out what factions exist. Uh, that is a three. I just want to check one thing on this. Yeah, roll on that. Note the name and symbol of a faction on a note card. Draw a landmark. Move a citizen from the... Change the active play. Right. Yeah, so, uh, factions. Rolling a three. Internal tensions. Two factions, one in control but struggling, the other resisting. What makes it hard for the leading faction to remain in control? Well, I think we kind of answered that just by our type of government. I'm just going to move my pool of citizens up here. Um, so I think our factions are going to be... Um, the factions will be, uh, we're going to have the, uh, they're going to call themselves the alphas and there is nothing in there about superiority. Uh, they're using alpha in the sense of the beginning. The alphas are those who arrived first, those who settled on this uh, democratic meritocracy, uh, who want to have this community run by necessity, and they are equally going to be opposed by a group calling themselves the savants. And the savants who are, they have, they have sort of um, been born out of people who have not, they've, they've been given power temporarily to resolve a scenario by the, meritoc the meritocratic uh, elections uh, and had it taken away again and they don't like the fact that they have lost that power. Um, they believe that uh, the, demo the, the alphas philosophy worked for the purposes of getting themselves started but now that they are started something more uh, consistent and coherent needs to be formed um, ostensibly a democratic uh, government rather than a merit uh, rather than the blend of democracy and merit uh, meritocracy but there's an autocratic and also slightly dictatorial mentality to the way that they're going about it um, the alphas are struggling to retain power because people are concerned that those who are best suited for the jobs have changed their mind and adopted this new philosophy. And also uh, because it isn't all the, the, the old philosophy isn't always working anymore. So I think that's where that comes from. Um, we also create symbology for factions when we create them uh, like um, heraldry essentially uh, I think the alphas is their symbol is going to be that of a road uh, so this is the symbol for the alphas uh, sorry this is very small for you guys I know um, it is a road kind of symbolizing going from one point and having following a road but having so many places to go and the servants are going to have uh, their symbol is going to be something more akin to This is terrible drawing, but something like a cogwheel. Um, we then draw, and I, now I think this is this this is where um, uh, the uh, where's it gone? The instructions for what we do here specify that we draw a landmark. Yeah. So roll on the table. Note the name and symbol of a faction. Obviously, we've had two. 
Draw a landmark and move a citizen. So the citi the faction in power is the Alphas at the moment, so they get a citizen. And we draw a landmark. Landmarks we haven't come across yet. So landmarks are buildings or places that stand out. They could be a statue, they could be a trade route, they could be a fishing harbour, whatever it happens to be. It's something that, you know, it's a wonder uh, or a city, city landmark. Um... They could be gigantic, they could be fairly small, uh, though obviously you want them to stand out somehow. Uh, the rule with these is you add them to the map. You can also take over old ones. You can um, uh, you can rediscover one that already exists, maybe find it in a different way. Um, we are going to put this into their main uh, city, and... Uh, or their main district. Uh, this is going to be sort of the Alpha's district. And it is going to be, what would be like a symbol of their power? It would be... It's going to be the trade route. Uh, or not trade route. It's going to be the... Um, the cro There's going to be a cross... That's what it is. It's the crossroads. Uh, and there is going to be a crossroads in the city. Um that splits three ways. And this is part of why they adopted the road. Uh, there's a crossroads there that the roads leading from it go to the lake, to the tuba farms, and to the river where there are bridges across. Uh, and that is their symbol, essentially, of uh, their power in the city. Not their power in the city, but their presence is the existence of this crossroads. Um, oh, and the Brawlers one. Oh, I see. There's two. Oh, I see. Twitch locked you out of one of your accounts. Well, that's frustrating. Um, Brawlers Wonder says RPGs are definitely a way to flex the creative muscle. Yes, uh, I agree. Um, and I think they're... I, I, having played with a GM, uh, it's in really interesting playing off somebody else as well. Uh, you know, what you can do when somebody is saying, okay, and now you're in this situation, how do you solve it? Versus when you're doing this, you, I can... Whatever comes out of my head is what goes into this game. Uh, they're both really interesting ways of working. So yes, they are fascinating. Uh, anyway, we have our landmark. So our final step uh, in this is to name the city. So what is our city going to be called? That is a good question. It is going to be called... Um... I can't decide if I've got this in my head because I just came up with it or if it exists already, but it's going to be called Hope's Reach. I think they were... The Alphas, when they first arrived, were close to not being able to keep going, and so this was as far as their hope would reach, and boom, they found civili Well, they found somewhere they could settle and form, reform civilization. Ah. Okay, so we are done with our um, founding phase. We move on to the development phase. Now, the development phase, um, we're going to run ten times because we are doing a grown city. And what you do there is you roll the dice on the D666 on the events table, which is pages long. It's basically the rest of this book. Uh, follow what it says and note the event down on the timeline. So there's going to be a timeline over here. And then if you want to, you can use... So I have 11 citizen tokens remaining because I have one on the alphas and I have one uh, on my first district. And then I have 11... No, sorry. Yes, 11 left because I had 13. Uh, and if I wish to, after each event, I can naturally grow the city... Um, which is uh, taking a citizen from the pool and adding it to the map. Um, and that, you add a district. And remember, adding a district can also mean expanding a district that already exists, if you want to. So, that's where we're at right now, and we basically play on from here. So, at this stage, we go to our D666 table. Uh, which starts here. And remember, I'm using the order red, yellow, blue. So red will be the first number, yellow will be the second number, and blue will be the third number. Let's just get on with it, see what happens. So, our first number, I'm just going to seal this off and form the timeline down here, is going to be 541. 
So, we go to table 541. It says, to the countryside. People leave the city to move to the suburbs or to the country. What makes this so attractive? Uh, add and remove a district. So, interesting. Um, this is obviously where we settled originally. Um, that district is actually going to be removed. So this token goes back to the pool. It's going to come straight back out again because we're also adding a district. Uh, I'm just going to very, very gently cross through. That's really interesting. So our very, very first district just immediately got removed. I'm just going to do this to the lines. The landmark stays put. That crossroads is still there. Um, but they're going to move to the countryside. The countryside and the suburbs. In this, you know, we're we're talking. This map is probably you know uh, fifty miles or something substantial. So they're going to move to here, and they're going to form a new district, and that new district is going to be a bit more of a. It's going to be less rigid, and it's going to be here. So this is our new district. Um, why, uh, so I'm going to say citizens moved away from the river. And I think that's ultimately what this is about. Uh, they have realized that, you know, they settled where they had to for efficiency to get things going so that they were close to the tuba farms, uh, they were relatively close to the lake, and they were close to access points across the river. Uh, once they had established themselves there, they realized they did not want to stay so close to the river uh, because of what had happened previously. Um, you know, they'd been close to a river, and that river had, uh, you know, uh, metaphorically speaking, betrayed them and destroyed their land and destroyed, um, uh, you know, where where their home was. And they don't want to take that chance again, so they moved away. And very, very sensibly, what they did was they simply moved south. Uh, they can still travel to the river if they want. There are still roadways that get them there, but they are still close to the lake and to the tubers. Uh, and so their food source and a natural, uh, comparatively natural water source still exists. Uh, and they have run, you know, uh, maglev lines or whatever it happens to be to for quick transportation to and from both those, but also they can use them to get to the river again if they need to cross uh, and go to the scrap pile. So, that seems to make sense to me. So they've simply moved south. Uh, you want to make all of your districts roughly the same size, so by drawing this one this size I kind of set the bar for roughly what they're going to be. Um, so that's that. Um, I think that's a very simple momentum, really, uh, and it kind of logically follows on from everything else that we've been describing so far. Um, I can, if I want, now choose to naturally grow things further, and I could if I wanted to expand this. I don't think I'm going to right now. I think I'm just going to let things be and see where else this goes, especially because of the unpredictability of immediately losing my first district by the nature of how people adjust it. Um, one thing that's maybe worth mentioning, uh, incidentally, is that uh, the primary number, so in this case my, my red die, this 5 here, that tells me that we are dealing with infrastructure events. Um, the events are, if you roll a 1, uh, you're dealing with warfare. Um, if you roll a 2, you're dealing with politics. If you roll a 3, you're dealing with economics. 4 is culture. 5 is infrastructure. And if you start with the 6s, you're dealing with environment. Uh, so, you know, you can get a rough idea of what you're dealing with uh, as you play. So that's our first roll. Uh, let's move on and roll again. We are going to get 6, 1, 1. Okay. So we are going to be dealing with environment. 611 is the first environmental thing. Ecological imbalance. Nature loses its footing and stumbles. Rivers move. Swamps dry out. How do the animals adapt? And what new resources or opportunities are created? Remove a terrain feature or a resource. This is interesting. Um, because we don't have an enormous amount on the board as of yet. Uh, we haven't actually even talked about animals, really. We've got the mollusks in the trench, um, it, sorry, in the lake, and the firefish in the trench. Um, 
I'm going to say... Interesting. Um... Because this is this could be interesting because this could be politically destabilizing as well. Uh, I'm going to say that the trench has actually. I'm not going to remove it completely. I'm going to go slightly against the uh, the grain there. But what I am going to do is I'm going to cut it here, uh, and I'm going to say what happened is that the um, I'm just going to cross this to indicate it's gone. The 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 seal at this end of the trench failed because it wasn't being maintained as well because they were moving further away and they were being a little bit more leisurely in their lives um, the importance of sealing this end of the trench was not fully realized and so what's actually happened is a tributary has essentially reformed where it was previously cut off and this has now become river again uh, the reason it got cut off here is the the huge influx of this incredibly polluted water reacted with all the firefish guano at the base and caused a chain reaction of explosions along the trench. Um, because of the volatility uh, of that guano, it actually ran faster than the water could refill the trench because it started as a bit of a crack. And it was when it kind of got to a, a gush of water that this started before it kind of broke through the final seal. And what happened was it blew up along the trench and the shockwaves going ahead of it collapsed the trench in on itself. But kind of in such a way that it sealed off the back half. Maybe there was a gap in the guano. Uh, you know, there's an area around there where the tubers stopped growing and the firefish may be kind of geared towards it or away from it. Um, and it blocked off that end of the trench. Uh, so the key thing down there is it hasn't even particularly... The guano hasn't been... And I realize I haven't drawn the guano on the map either. Um, I'm going to draw that as these little things. Uh, it hasn't gone away per se. It's still down there. But people don't want to harvest it anymore because it is dangerous, but also because it is, um, uh, you know, ultimately it's firefish crab. Uh, and bringing that stuff over the tubers is not going to be good. It's not hygienic. It's potentially very, very dangerous. And so while the resource hasn't potentially exactly been lost, it can't be harvested anymore. Um, so, uh, trench seal failed and destroyed. What's that? Two thirds of the trench. Guano no longer harvestable. So I'm going to do, rather than completely taking it out, I'm going to do kind of like a verboten sign over the top of that uh, to indicate that it can't be harvested anymore. Now, I'm going to say because of that, I'm going to do some natural growth, and there is going to be a new district that's going to form here. And this is going to be somewhat more rigidly militaristic. Uh, so it's going to be, not militaristic, that's the wrong word, but it's going to be very, very defined like so, and I'm going to bring a citizen cube and place it in there. That is now not somewhere you want to be because you're right next to the river, but it is an outpost essentially that monitors the entire situation. They, it's, it's, uh, there are scientists in there who are studying the surroundings. Uh, there are geologists to make sure this isn't going to get any worse. There are also engineers who are there to ensure, to, to continue sealing up the river and to ensure permanent maintenance uh, is taking place. Um, this is not somewhere that uh, people stay 100% of the time. They come, they go, um, kind of like an oil rig. 
you know, you spend a certain amount of time out there and then you have to come back because it's just not mentally safe to stay there the entire time. Um, so that's what that is, and that's what that's going to be. Uh, Martini Tiny says, can you hypothetically use this map for other games? Sorry, came in late. Other RPGs, rather, after you've built it. Also, hi. Hi, Martini Tiny. And yes, that is essentially the entire purpose of the game. Let me quickly throw up for you the uh, cover, the, the, the front page. It's a city-building game to generate playable settlements for use in other creative endeavours. Um, in my case, my creative endeavour is I stream board games and RPGs, and so I am streaming this, and that is the extent of my use at this point. And I'm going to hold that in place. But, yes, this map is 100%, as long as I don't screw it up, usable down the line as a means of, you know, it's a game world that you have created. So yes, it's 100% usable uh, in other games. That's uh, that's sort of what it was designed for, but also, um, you know, it's a, it would be a purpose with this anyway, I think. And, and uh, myself and uh, Jen, uh, who's one of my regular viewers, were actually talking about this. And it's I'm actually playing several games, like I played Cartographers and uh, Railroading. Like any game, really, that involves a map can generate something that you can use in other games. But this game was sort of explicitly designed with that in mind. Okay, let's roll them up. What are we going to get? We are going to get two, six, two. So twos are going to be, not economy, I don't think. Politics, two, six, two. A useful neighbor. Close contacts to a nearby settlement is established. What makes them useful? Are they easy to exploit or just the right market for the city's goods? Add a new external faction. Okay, so we get a new faction. These are going to be... The um, they are going to be the biotech, and the biotech are um, uh, food manufacturers. They're, they're biological manufacturers, so they'll they'll manufacture anything, but food is kind of their, their primary thing. Um, and their symbol is simply going to be a flower. Very basic. My drawing skill is absolutely appalling. Um, I'm going to particularly note that for the Braless Wonder, who is watching, who is a graphic designer. And uh, no, I don't draw well. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I hire people to do things. And yes, there is a whole glow up of the Once Upon a Die graphic design and things like that that will be coming soon. But yes, the biotech. Um, uh, found the biotech. And they have their manu manufacturing plants. And the biotech, are they easy to exploit or just the right market? They're the right market. Uh, this is actually a fairly um, civilized relationship. Uh, we provide them with a percentage of the tubers that are manufactured. Like, our, our people still eat the tubers, but we provide them with a percentage of the tubers and a percentage of the uh, purified water from the lake, a smaller percentage of that. And um, uh, they manufacture things with it. Uh, I'm going to say they're the right market for food trade, but I would say they're probably also finding ways of turning the tubers into other things, um, probably like a synthetic... Uh, uh, or not uh, a partially synthetic fabric and things like that, where they can weave in actual uh, biological material to make it easier to wear, things like that. Um, but they are a convenient faction to have kicking around. We are going to actually put another district out onto the board. Um, they are going to have formed where we came from, and so we're going to form a district here. No, we're not. No, they're not from where we came from. They're going to be over here. We're going to form a district over here. Um which is gonna be kind of that shape because no one wants to get too close to the river. And that district is going to essentially be the trading hub. Um, so I'm, I'm just gonna write trade, maintenance. I just definitely got a cube and then didn't use it. Uh, town center. I'm not being very imaginative in how I name these. This is more just for my reference. Um, and then this is going to be Old Town. 
because everywhere has to have an old town, right? Um, so that's who they are, the biotech. They're extremely helpful, and uh, they're allowing us to maybe prosper a little bit more than we were, and uh, in turn, we're being able to assist them by providing them a lot of the natural resources. Thus far, at least, it has been an extremely profitable relationship. What's that? That is five, four, five. So this is going to be another political, no, infrastructure. 545. Uh, a project ends in tragedy. Negligence or malice, but something led to tragedy. What happened, and who has to pay for this disaster? Remove something, and a faction loses power. Okay. Uh, I want to just double check something regarding factions. There we go. Faction power, blah, 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 blah. Uh, adding a faction, removing a faction. Uh, I'm not removing a faction. Uh, gaining power. Take any number of citizen tokens from the city or from other factions and move them to the faction gaining power. This represents people supporting. If faction loses power, move any number of citizen tokens from the faction back to the city or spread them out among the other factions. This shows the citizens are no longer supporting the faction, either abandoning it for one or something on the above. Right, yes, okay. So yes, the, the manipulation of faction power. So this, the alphas currently have the faction power. Uh, this is either going to go to the other factions or it is going to go back onto the city. It doesn't go back into the pool again. Um, oh, I guess actually that's one thing. I may have made a mistake there. Uh, removing districts. Oh no, yeah, when you remove a district, you move a citizen token from the city or the factions back into the pool. Um, so yes, the... Uh, um, I was meant to do that earlier. So this is interesting. A project ends in tragedy, negligence or malice. Um... Let's say... And I have to remove something. Hmm. Um... Okay. So, um... Let's say... The alphas, in the interest of improving trade with the biotech, were attempting to create a. Um, uh, they were attempting to create a maglev line from Hope's Reach to the biotech settlement. Uh, the problem with that being, um, they rushed it. They were trying to do this too quickly, and in excavating in the mountain range, they caused a chain reaction amongst the um, amongst this this polarized metal uh, and it has essentially the metal is still there but it has lost or at least everything that is currently reachable uh, prior to you know enormous uh, and colossally expensive, digging operations that are probably at the end of this game roughly about the right time to kind of start thinking about doing that again but all the surface material has been destroyed um so surface i'm going to put pol metal uh i'm going to say nullified and there is none of it left so the maglevs can't actually be built uh economically anymore it would take an enormous amount of funding and or I guess funding's kind of a uh, it would take resources beyond the capability of Hope's Reach at this point in its development to further uh, kind of keep going with any of this as a result of that that is the seed that the savants now, there, it wasn't malice it was negligence and and uh, speed on behalf of the alphas but they lose power and the savants have now taken it over and the first thing that they are going to do is they are going to also construct another district uh, and their district is going to be geared towards uh, ensuring that um, it's essentially going to be uh, a ge geological team looking for means of getting this back so geological rescue. Um, so geology. 
and that is going to be seven. Um, I guess to an extent, maybe I should be, I'm going to just draw a triangle here, triangle here, circle here, triangle here that is now going to get crossed through and become a circle, just to indicate the rough and actually triangle here. Uh, just to indicate the sources of, or the origins of power in those districts. The Alphas still have influence, but they have lost control. Uh, and the government has essentially begun to switch towards a democratic society. Okay. Oh, and... That resource is no longer available. One, three, four. So we're dealing with warfare... 134 says, a foreign war spills over. Someone else wages war, but its effects can be felt here. A wave of refugees, improve demand on the city's forges, add or remove something. Okay. I'm going to add... Um, it is going to be refugees. Uh, refugees from a distant war found their way here. Resources become stretched. It is getting uncomfortable how many refugees have come in. There's going to be a big refugee camp set up here. Uh, that's what I'm adding is a district that's the refugee camp. That is getting crazy busy. Um, it's a lot. Uh, it's it's a drain on the city's resources because there are so many people coming in ex from ex uh, sort of external um, situations. They are tired. They are hungry. They've been walking forever. Uh, they haven't been able to use you know their their sort of factions government has taken over the transportation systems. They have not been able to use them to get out. Uh, you know they have. Um, vehicles, they have uh, anti-grav cars and things like that, but they don't really have enough. They have enough to bring their belongings, and uh, they've come from a more uh, well-to-do society, and so typically they've attempted to leave with far too much stuff. And uh, bickering came up, they didn't really, you know, their, their people uh, fought amongst themselves over what they had, uh, uh, and it basically caused too many problems. And they've got to a point now where the majority of their vehicles were destroyed. They've had to walk the rest of the way. A lot, a lot of them have lost or had to throw away a lot of their goods. Some of them have been stolen by other people who've disappeared into the night, and heavens only knows what happens to them. But still, so many have come, and that is a massive drain on the resources of a city that was not really designed for that kind of input. Um, Red-headed coffee shop girl says, Awesome, thank you. Uh, I am glad you are enjoying. Uh, Martini says, very cool, what a great idea. I assume that is to the discussion of uh, the purpose of Ex Novo. Uh, I agree. I think this is a really cool concept. Solo RPGs seem to have really interesting um, purposes behind them in the sense that they deliberately attempt to achieve things that other games I've seen don't. That may... Now, this is a one to four player. Uh, that may be very true of multiplayer as well. I'm just not as familiar. Um... <laughs> Bralis Wonder says, no, you're wonderful. I assume you're referring to my drawing there, saying, no, you're wonderful. Thank you. That, I appreciate that. My, my comments on uh, not being an artist. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, but I certainly don't have your skill, that's for sure. Um, okay, so that's what's going on. Uh, I'm going to choose, and I just realized there's one thing I want to double check on myself here. Um... Yeah, I'm this. I'm going to naturally choose to grow the density of the refugee camp because it's huge. So it has two citizen tokens now because it is insanely busy. And right now they don't have any political affiliations. Um, it's worth noting these are all people living in the city, including the savants. I sort of touched on this earlier, but just to reiterate now that it's more visual, the savants still live in the city. And there's probably way more people than these cubes represent. This is just the power base uh, that exists in the city right now. There's a lot of political 
indifference, which given the infighting that's been going on makes a great deal of sense. Um, but, you know, th- it, it, this isn't to say that there aren't more people and this isn't to say that these people don't live here and that these people don't have political interest. They just don't have a strong political standing that makes them part of any of that. Anyway, we're halfway through the development of our city, so let's roll up again. Uh, that is going to be a 3, 4, 5. Uh, 3 is economy, I think. Yes. So 3, 4, 5 is going to be economic crisis. Stocks plummet, price rises, goods spoil. Was this mismanagement or economic sabotage? Do the responsible get away unscathed? Remove a resource and the faction loses power. Well, I think biotech have turned out not to be our friends after... Well, no, that's not true. They have turned out absolutely to be our friends. Um, But they were friends to the alphas, and they don't like the way that the savants have been running things. Um, They stop providing, you know, huge cargo loads of tubers and and, uh, purified water have gone over to them, and they haven't delivered the product back, the the, the post-manufacturing product, Um, which causes absolute havoc, especially where the refugees are concerned. People are actually, you know, tubers become a much bigger part of the diet, um, and there's a concern of over-farming because the food isn't being uh, post-produced in any way. Uh, Its raw resources being consumed at a much higher rate. So um, we're going to say biotech. I can't right today. Biotech uh, sabotages economy to protest savant policy. And they essentially, in the process, they are not gaining government over the city per se. The Hope's Reach is in turmoil right now, but they have gained the influential power because people have realized their importance. And I feel like at this point in time, if biotech was a bit more aggressive and tried to annex Hope's Reach, Hope's Reach would go, yeah, sure, come in. You know, bring it. Let's get back to having a solid relationship and all that kind of thing. Mm. So that's where they're at right now. Um, uh, Biotech has proved that they are willing to make sure that their status quo is maintained. They want to ensure that things are what they want them to be. Uh, and they're not happy with what the Samants are doing at all. So there we go. Interesting developments abound. I'm just going to move on. For, uh, what was the, uh, That was all I did. Oh, remove a resource. Right. Um, you know what I'm actually going to do? I'm going to retroactively have added... Uh, because I think this fits the narrative better. I'm going to have added, like, that's supposed to be a can of food, uh, processed food as a resource. That is now being removed. Um, I know that's kind of cheeky, because I'm not removing something that was already on the map, but I think as I'm playing through this, I'm realizing that things have importance that I haven't placed on them previously. And I think that canned food would have been, or processed food rather, would have been a resource because that is what we are gaining from our trade with the biotech. So that has gone away. Next up, we have 541. Did I not just do 541? Because there are 216 results, by the way, I should have said this at the beginning, but my intention is not to accept a repeat roll. Just because I want to... Uh, Yeah, that was to the countryside. We're not going to do that again. I want to ensure that there's some variety in play here. Uh, 512. Okay, that's different. It's still going to be infrastructure. This is going to be city beautification. New parks, new avenues, new roads. Who plans this? And is this a smooth transition or is force needed? Add a landmark or district. Um... This is biotech exerting their influence. They come into the city and they are kind of of the mindset that um, they don't want to take over government of a new city. They are extremely conscious of their own value in this society. Uh, And if they keep this perfect thing that they have going, going, they are going to be able to... uh, 
you know, ensure their own importance and therefore continued existence in this world. They are not interested in diversifying, uh, and they are not interested in expanding their influence to a point where they cannot retain what it is that they have right now. So, biotech influences refugees by beautifying the camp. I should have written refugees here. So, they are going to build a landmark. Um, and I think, you know, they've obviously, as it says in the prompt, they've improved the roads, they've improved the, the, the living conditions, uh, they've cleaned up the camp a lot. Uh, but what they have done, I'm just going to move those for a moment, is they've put in a park. And they built this park as a relaxation point because ultimately the refugees haven't really been able to stop since they arrived. And so the key thing is an area for them to wind down and kind of, you know, be themselves a little bit. And this park is their big opportunity to do that. Uh, it gives them somewhere where they can go and wind down and take a little bit of time to reconnect and, uh, you know, begin to plan outside of, of just survival uh, and having got away and having this tense back and forth with pr uh, you know consistency of provisions from the city without overdraining the resources to the point where uh, the city turns on them and turfs them back out again. So there we go. There is a landmark. Um, I've still got six cubes left. I've got three more prompts doesn't matter if I don't use all the cubes by the end of the game, incidentally. There is no need to do so. I may have to. I may choose to. However this goes. 3, 6, 4. 3, 6, 4 is going to be economic. And it is going to be taxes. An unavoidable death. Are taxes raised... As, oh, sorry, as unavoidable as death. Are taxes raised or lowered, though? And what are they used for? Add or remove something. Hmm. Um. Interesting. Uh. Taxes are going to be. Uh, taxes have been raised. They are being put up. Uh, they are being put up by the servants, which is not going to gain them any kind of uh, uh, positive influence at all. But they are being raised, and they're being raised in order to try to build some sense of uh, sluicing on the river. Um, and uh, they're trying to kind of gain some, kind, uh, some sense of uh, improvement in the area by making the life, supposedly at least, making the life easier for the maintenance crew. Um, and uh, also improving, they think it might be something towards the, uh, uh, oh, I'm also going to do, oh, excuse me, I'm just going to do a star in there that's the savants, uh, the biotech, sorry, have some influence over the refugees. Uh, the hope is it will also assist them in their ge geology research. So they are going to build giant sluice gates to try to control um, the river's flow somewhat and see if they can't ultimately find a way of purifying it by reducing um, uh, reducing its flow. Um, uh, okay. So, we'll see what happens with that, whether that's a beneficial thing or not, but taxes raised for sluice gates by servants. That is not helping them gain any power. Um, sorry, give me half a second. Uh, 
Um, do, 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 do. Um, we are going to do another roll. So uh, we have got five, two, two, which is going to be five, two, two shall be a center of learning. A grand university or a martial arts dojo of renown? How are students selected and what is the price of admission? Add a landmark and a resource. Interesting. Um, so we are going to add a... Uh, the university is obviously the landmark. Uh, that is going to be... Uh, the university is going to be placed... That's still so much of a wasteland. I think this it's going to be less of a university. It's going to be more of a... Um, uh, a scientific outpost um, that is used for training people in order to try and reclaim more of the area. Because right now, the city is entirely confined to the south side of the river, and that is limiting... It is also not, it's, it's a great deal of effort for them to gain any benefit out of the scrap pile. Um, and so what they are going to do is they're going to construct an outpost over on this side. Um, and it's going to look a little something like this. Uh, and... There's our outpost, uh, and I'm going to add a resource, and that resource is going to be... They're going to have done it. The resource is going to be... Uh, I'm going to do that, and it's going to be this. Hydrothermal energy. Um, or hydro hydro generated energy, I guess. Uh, but it is going to come uh, so scientific uh, exploratory outpost added after uh, success of hydro power. development. So that's the deal, is they're going to have developed this hydropower. Uh, it is now easier for society because they have a power source that is using the thing that has been working against them for so long. They have, they've surmounted it and turned it into something useful, both in terms of heat, because goodness only knows the rubbish that's in the river has heated up the temperature, um, and in terms of the fact that the water flow also gives it power. So they are, they are generating both kinds because of that they are in, uh, there's an empowerment and there's a basically kind of like a cessation of hostility between the savants and the alphas uh to subsequently allow themselves to work together and develop this scientific um uh, sort of uh, forward-looking program to try and improve life for the entire city essentially uh, the hatchet is at least ostensibly beginning to be buried uh, and we have one final roll in our development phase. Uh, that is going to be one. Oh, I also need a. Um, I'm going to add this as a district at the end of that, and that is going to be the outpost. This the landmark is sort of the outpost research building. This is where the scientists live. That, oh, and how are they selected? Um, they are selected. There's a meritocrat. It's essentially an entrance exam. Uh, it's a meritocratic selection, but it is done... So it, it's the, the alphas... Uh, it's a blending of methodologies and a blending of philosophies. Uh, people are suggested by the community, um, and they are elected onto uh, essentially uh, a final, I don't know, 50 final hundred people, and they those people are then tested to become members of the university. Or of the outpost, sorry. Uh, so it's a blend of meritocracy, democracy, and 
uh, that wish to have a governing body that the savants provide. Um, so this area is actually going to be a triangle and a circle. Because uh, it is both of them. And then our final roll is 144. 144 is a warfare event. And it says, a spy has stolen secrets. What were they and what damage could be done to the city with such knowledge? Um, I think that has got to be... Uh, spy uh, has stolen research into lake purification by mollusks. We don't, it's, there's no true knowledge of how the mollusks are purifying the lake, but what research has been done has been stolen and could render lake politically and economically useless. So, yeah, that could completely nullify one of the things that makes Hope's Reach so successful, uh, which is the lake. Um, to that end, there is going to be, and I guess it makes sense to put it over here, uh, there is going to be a new district formed, um, which is essentially guards, uh, where previously guard the guards had been very, very much, you know, perimeter watching and ensuring that things progress as they should and maintaining security, there is now an external threat, uh, quite possibly from whoever forced the refugees out. Um, and we have to defend ourselves against them. So the guards are in place to do that. Uh, and that is... Yeah. Uh, that's that's a very, very dangerous situation for this city because if that final secret gets stolen, who knows? If that's what's feeding those tubers, the tubers start growing ever elsewhere The uh, until the um, uh, deeper excavation is possible into the polarized metals. Uh, the only resource left to this city would be the geothermal, uh, the hydro hydrothermal energy and the steel that's in the scrap pile. Uh, the steel is nothing special. The hydrothermal energy would be the only thing worth something. And goodness knows in this kind of civilization, transporting energy beyond the boundaries of the city that is generating it is probably not that easy. So there we have it. That's our 10 de developmental phases. Uh, we now go into the uh, topping off phase. Um, and uh, Sorry, topping out phase. Uh, and the topping out phase uh, is you basically, uh, in player order, or in this case just myself, uh, you take turns using the remaining citizens to fill out districts. You cannot add districts at this point, but you can increase the density of existing ones. Um, this is basically showing normal city growth that has happened, but wasn't noticed at the time that it was happening. You know, it wasn't important to the, the overall political, economical landscape of what was happening. Uh, but quietly off in the corner, things were building. And I think the most logical thing I can do straight away is I'm actually going to use two of my remaining to max out the town centre. So that has full... Um, uh, um, full capacity at this point in time. Uh, I think that the geological study has become increasingly important because of, uh, you know, what's going on. We need to work out how we can get down lower into the ground. And that whole section has just increased uh, because of the importance of that. And as things have gone on, that scientific outpost up here uh, has really gained some traction. And that is also now at max. And that's my full pull used. Uh, so the power in this game never really fluctuated that much. Um, but this city has certainly grown a great deal. Uh, and then as a final f finishing touch, everyone gets to name one feature that was on the map. It could be a, you know one of the features that was already there, uh, or it could be a landmark. You can add a landmark if you want to. Uh, all of those things can be done. Um, and uh, I think I am going to name 
the scientific outpost. Um, it's going to be, this is going to be almost like a mini suburb and it is going to be named Hope's Resurgence. Seems appropriate for the outpost of Hope's Reach that potentially sees it going off into, uh, uh, you know, into a much better place. So there we have it. Um, I can't really zoom in very easily on this, uh, but this is Hope's Reach. Um, now that we know what's blank, I think I can do the old, you know, what you do on a map. There we have it, Hope's Reach. Uh, that is the city that we have developed, and that was Ex Novo. That is a, I think, I hope, relatively good example of how this game plays, and it's something different to what I've seen, because as I say, I've seen fantasy maps been drawn with this. I haven't seen something that's a bit more kind of, I don't know what this is exactly. Not cyberpunk, certainly, although in my head, I think I was sort of gearing towards that, but the way that this sort of came out and the fact that the river was the, it was so interesting I came into this going cyberpunk would be really cool oh wait our primary feature is a river let's make that river a garbage river and that's kind of where all of this came from so interesting kind of development there in my own head just immediately changing tack to something wholly more gritty and kind of not Mad Max-ish but um, something that's in that kind of uh, desolate wasteland yeah, it was kind of Wastelander, Diesel Punk kind of thing. Um, but this is just such a cool experience. Like, we have this map. This is a full-grown society with three factions influencing this city. Uh, the most influence actually even being on an external faction. Even despite that, you know, maybe the Alphas and the Savants, uh, you know, the key members of those almost form an additional faction now that's a little bit more geared towards a combined philosophy. Um, but it kind of gives you something really, really different, and I don't think I would have generated all of the backstory I just did without a little bit of a nudge from the game, because uh, it just it gets you to ask such interesting questions. And if I had a better knowledge of political science and uh, you know how cities form over time, I might have been able to kind of make this even more realistic than I did. Uh, I don't really know how realistic this is for a post-apocalyptia. You know, you don't. It's it's difficult to say, but. I think it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating concept and such a wonderful way to build a backstory. Uh, as an author, um, you know, that's really cool. Uh, as somebody who likes playing games, just having this in my head now, you know, I could, I could play an RPG based on a character in Hope's Reach uh, and be perfectly comfortable knowing where they come from and what their struggles might be. Um, it's really, really cool. So I recommend this. Um, so again, if you're interested in this, you can find it at Shark Bombs, uh, which I assume is short for Shark Bomb Studio, sharkbombs.itch.io, uh, and it's available there and it's on sale right now, um, $8 for the game. It's absolutely fantastic. I really enjoy it. Uh, Incidentally, I am going to sort of mention where RPGs are coming from, just because they're a little bit different, especially these kind of print-and-play things are different to board games where, you know, you get them from a board game store or online or whatever. Um, these have specific locations to find them. So do check them out. I think uh, Martin and Konstantinos have come up with a, a really cool uh, game here. Uh, and it's something that has potentially got purpose if you want to use it for a future world. At, at the same time, it doesn't have to. This could be it. Like, I've just finished this game and I don't have to ever use these these factions again. Uh, if I don't want to. I think I probably do, because I'm really intrigued in knowing where else Hope's Reach goes. Um, but that's that. I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, so... Yes, with, without uh, sort of carrying this on too long, just a, a couple of quick bits of admin. Um, if you don't know what I do, this is what I do. I do solo games. Uh, if you're following, if you're watching me right now, rather, on Twitch and you're not following me, please do so. Uh, please also head over to YouTube. I've just uh, posted the link in the chat. Uh, my YouTube channel, I upload all the games that I play onto YouTube after I'm done. Um... The If you're watching this on YouTube after the fact, please head to twitch.tv forward slash once upon a die and check me out over there and give me a follow over there because that's where all of this stuff comes from. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, to, to give you an idea of my spread, I don't just do 
uh, RPGs. I also do solo board games. If you haven't seen any of my other videos, um, that's what I do uh, primarily, actually. But I've shifted into doing solo RPGs because I enjoyed the experience so much. Um, I would love it if you would check out my greater body of work. Please also do look at the podcast, Once Upon a Die. It's available wherever you get your podcasts from, and it's a podcast about solo board games. Um, so it kind of covers a uh, bit of everything, really. It's been on hiatus for a very long time now, but I will be bringing it back, um, and it's something I'm really looking forward to getting going again. So I would love to have a few people listening to it at the time that that comes back to, the, to, uh, to existence. Um, do also check out, and I'm just going to put again for anyone who's on uh, um, uh, Twitch right now, uh, sorry for those who aren't, but I'm just posting links to Moyle's Meticulous Minis and Into the Meepleverse, uh, which are two fantastic Twitch streams you can follow. Uh, Scott Moyle paints amazing quality miniatures. Uh, he's a fabulous painter, and he does four streams a week painting and uh, commentating as he does and chatting with his audience, and he's fabulous at that. And uh, Into the Meepleverse is a Twitch stream and podcast uh, by my friend Billy and... Uh, my or my friends, I should say, Billy and Maggie, although I think Billy's primarily running the stream himself. Uh, I've caught quite a few of his streams, and they are excellent, uh, and he has guests on... Uh, based on, you know, obviously who he's isolating with and who's in his bubble right now, uh, or who is in his bubble, I guess. Uh, so he does sort of, uh, you know, multiplayer stuff, although he's told me recently he's been interested in solo games, and he did recently solo Seventh Continent. So if you haven't seen that, give that a, a look as well. And finally, uh, you'll see up in the... Um, I'm going to get this wrong, because I always do. No, this corner, over, over that way. Uh, the Discord. Um, that Discord channel is for... Moyle's Meticulous Minis, Into the Meepleverse, and Once Upon a Die. So head over to Discord if you would like to join in the discussion with us. Um, and, uh, you know, feel free to start chats or respond to anything that we're posting over there. And we'd love for you to become a part of our community. So, uh, yeah, please head over there and check out what we all do. Um, without further ado, I think that is uh, everything from me. Thank you so much for coming to join me today. Thank you for, for watching this playthrough of Ex Novo. I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed playing it and developing this really cool society, uh, which I will be doing something with, I'm sure, in the not-too-distant future. Uh, I will be streaming again on Saturday morning, that's August the 1st, at 11.30am, and I'm going to be streaming a Kickstarter preview uh, of the game Roll Camera, uh, which is a dice-based worker placement about f uh, shooting a film. So please do come and join me for that. I hope that you will, and I hope that you will enjoy it. Uh, and in the meantime, I hope that you have a good rest of week, and I will see you at the weekend, and keep rolling those dice until the game is done. Thank you, and have a good day.